Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming along tonight. My name is Adam Macbeth. I'm one of the deputy directors of the Caston Centre for Human Rights Law. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land we're gathered today and to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Tonight we are here to launch the second edition of the Public Interest Law Careers Guide, which is a joint project of the Caston Centre and the Progressive Law Net Network. The, um, the first edition of the guide was viewed over 50,000 times, so um, a strong interest, obviously, in, um, in social justice careers from, from all students and parents there. Tonight we have four speakers who are going to share with you their very uh, different pathways uh, into, um, into uh, human rights law careers. We have Holly Tan, um, who's a, a policy officer at the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, Catherine Brown, a training lawyer um, at the Victorian Government Solicitor's Office. Uh, Alina Leakin, uh, whose name I may or may not have pronounced correctly, uh, who is a lawyer at the Human Rights Law Centre, and her colleague Lee Carney, also a lawyer at the Human Rights Law Centre. Uh, but before uh, you hear from them, um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Kirsty Wise from the um, Progressive Law Network. And Kirsty is the, the driving force behind this version of the guide. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Kirsty. Thank you. Um, before I start, I would also like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land we are gathered today and pay my respect to Elders past and present. Thank you everyone for turning out tonight despite the chilly weather. Um, I'm sure everyone will have something to gain from our panellists tonight. My name is Kirsty and I am the Vice President of the Progressive Law Network. Alongside my subcommittee, I have worked tirelessly, tirelessly on updating the guide this year. I remember at my first lecture at Monash, um, the lecturer asked who was studying law for the money and who was studying it to help people. There weren't too many hands raised for the second option. But it's great to see so many people turn out tonight who are interested in public law. The increasing interest in this area is why the PLN created the guide, so that people interested in public law are more aware of how they, they can use their law degree to help people in the community. The guide is a great resource for secondary and tertiary students as well as young lawyers to help find and match opportunities to what they want to pursue. From community legal centres to government and policy work, the guide canvasses many opportunities. The guide was set up by the PLN and the Carsten Centre in 2011 and funded by a grant from the Victoria Law Foundation. I would like to say a big thank you to everyone who on um, my subcommittee for helping out with the guide. It was a lot more work than we originally planned, so I appreciate the time and dedication of everyone who helped out. I would particularly like to thank Zoha Haider, Iris Rad, Sean Hope, Chiquita Shaw, and James Matheson. Finally, I would like to thank the Carsten Centre, particularly Janice Hugo, Maria Smith, and Caitlin McInnes, who I worked with on the guide. For those who are not already part of the PLN, I highly recommend getting involved. We have great opportunities for law students who are passionate about human rights and public law. We have our AGM coming up on Friday, October 14 at 2 p.m where we will be electing new members on the committee. We also have some great opportunities coming up, including a mental health portfolio and some policy projects on the way. So to find out more, just like us on Facebook on Progressive Law Network. I hope everyone enjoys tonight. Um, more specifically, I'm in the Family Violence Reform and Service Delivery Unit. Um, so I'll just give a bit of a run through. I've only been there for two months and I only finished uni in June, so I'm actually in quite a many single position to all of you now. Um, so, the studying law, I was pretty sure I didn't want to be a corporate lawyer, um, but I wasn't really sure of what to do. So I worked in a hospitality job for the first four years and just worked and studied and had a social life, things like that. Definitely didn't get involved in as many things as I could have, but I might just, yeah, give some advice later regarding that. Um, and then I thought I'd better get some legal experience. So I got a job through the Monash Careers Gateway, um, helping a sole practitioner with some conveyancing, which was interesting, also a bit boring. Um, <laughs> worked there for a couple of months, and then she actually didn't end up paying me. Um, so I went back to my hospitality job. Um, and then I went on exchange. I'm just trying to get this in the right order. Doesn't really matter if not. And then um, I did professional practice within the unit of Monash at Springdale Monash Legal Service. So that was really great, really good insight into um, community legal se sector. Um, and 
and so that was yeah definitely one of my the, like, initial sort of experiences I got. And um, then I think I went on exchange after that and came back and I just, there was two weeks left of the clerkship application period and I thought, oh, I haven't really thought about what to do, I better just apply. So I scrambled together, I think it maybe seven applications, got rejected for all of them, which was probably fair enough because I didn't have an interest in pursuing that career. Um, and then I thought, you know, obviously that rejection is never like, oh, okay, I'm obviously not very employable. So I thought, I better just do some things over summer to try and, yeah, you have to get some professional experience. So one of them was, this is in my, uh, just before my fifth year, at the end of my fifth year. Um, so I did advanced professional practice. So Monash definitely has these opportunities to make the most of that you don't have to compete with as many people for. Um, and so I did the Sakaza unit at Springvale, which is assisting sexual assault victims with victims of crime compensation applications. Um, so I did that over the summer and I also got in touch with the Victorian Commissioner for Gender and Sexuality um, as my brother had worked with her previously and he suggested I just get in touch and see if I could intern or something so I sent an email and ended up getting a paid internship at the Department of Premier and Cabinet through that. Um, so I did that two days a week and I was at Sakars the other days. Um, so they were really, I guess, I guess I built up that employable experience quite late later on in my degree which um, worked out in the end um, and then I after that internship finished up in February I was able to continue on in a different branch two days a week as a policy officer so I guess I could kind of prove myself in the internship and then get a casual role out of that and then um, in June this year the expression of interest I opened up for the family balance reform unit which was going to be massive to implement the Royal Commission's recommendations and I had experience in government and I've also worked on the ground with people at Sakaza um, with sexual assault victims so that really lined up well I hadn't sought out those I didn't know where those opportunities would lead me but it aligned really well and I'm yeah really happy in my role at the moment um, so yeah just in terms of things I wish I'd known and advice um, I definitely could have got involved more in things in the first few years, not employable things, but just, I don't know, sports or other extracurricular activities. I definitely took law pretty seriously. I thought, I've got to get good marks. All I felt I had time for was studying and working and, you know, having a partner, things like that. But I probably could have relaxed a bit and done more interesting stuff. Um, I find now I'm volunteering more, which is strange, because I've got volunteering roles and I'm working full time. Um, and also, yeah, yeah. So there's um, some to list here. Oh, and definitely, um, I think any experience is valuable. So the work I did with the conveyance, I think all those things add up and they sort of snowball into having, you know, more of a more stuff on your resume, which is useful. So I think they're the main tips I give. Thanks. What does things have been? Feel very serious standing up at the left hand. It's like being a little kid at the big kids' table. Um, but we we're just saying how great that is because you used to, you know, come to these events at uni and you'd have like the head of human rights watch or something and someone would say, How did you get there? And they're like, Oh, you know, I just worked in a job for 20 years and then got promoted. And like, oh, great, I'll give that a shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought I'd give you sort of a, a quick rundown of what I'm doing at the moment. Um, how I got to what I'm doing at the moment, and then also we've been asked to sort of give some advice from what we've learned. Um, so I'm a trainee lawyer at VGSO. Uh, so we are the Victorian Government Solicitor's Office. Um, we're not the OPP, as most people seem to think we are. We don't do the ex we do do the exciting stuff, but not that sort of exciting stuff. Um, so as a trainee, then you rotate through our four branches. Um, so there's opportunities to do commercial work in a government context, opportunities to do workplace law litigation law and government and public law. Um, so in many ways it's similar to working in a commercial firm, but all the work we do is for government, so it has that sort of policy, political overlay, I suppose. Um, the other interesting thing for me personally, and probably for a lot of you in this room, is that we do a lot of um, public law work. So we do a lot of constitutional work, we have high court matters all the time, we do a lot of charter work as well, so it's a really unique opportunity sort of get across how human rights law actually works in practice. 
both advising the Attorney General when he's going to intervene about the charter issue in court and also day-to-day -day advising departments about how to comply with the charter. Um, the other thing that I'm doing at the moment is um, I run a program called Young Liberty for Law Reform. Uh, so it's a program of Liberty Victoria and it's basically we have volunteers who come on board for a year. Uh, they're young legal professionals, students, and they work on discrete strategic advocacy projects. Um, so examples are uh, our Mikey Kinds website, which Emma and the Green Barons created <laughs> last year. Uh, we did a report on whistleblowing in offshore detention centres. So that's sort of another, I guess, area of interest and thing for you guys to think about is whether you want to sort of be involved in also that more systemic sort of change. Um, in terms of how I got to where I am, my first sort of job in the law was in a criminal defence firm working as a paralegal. Um, and for anyone who's interested in public interest work and wants to help people, um, I really recommend thinking about a career in criminal law. It's really interesting, it's fast paced, um, and you're often representing people who otherwise wouldn't have a voice in the system. Um, I then did a Caston Centre Global Internship um, at the Centre for Constitutional Rights, and that was sort of what started my interest in moving away from doing just straight law and thinking a bit more about how to combine law with campaigns and advocacy and make bigger changes. Um, I've also worked in policy at the Sentencing Council, which again, for anyone interested in public interest, sort of big ideas rather than the little nitty gritty, what are the details of this contract, policy is where it's at. Um, also, I've done a bit of non-legal volunteering, which I thought was you know, moving into the advice section, something I'd really recommend. I think, you know, doing a law degree is pretty full on. You've got to do it for a really long time. Um, there's a lot of law. There's a lot of legal volunteering, legal, you know, legal jobs, clerkships, all this pressure. It can be really great to just do something completely different and you'll often learn a lot from it. So that's just my advice. Um, I thought though, there were two, when I was thinking sort of, how did I get here, where do I want to go, what, what have I learned, what can I possibly tell people? There were two things that kind of struck me being in sort of my first six months of my full-time job. The first is when you're thinking about what sort of job you want, to think about your personality as well as the things you're interested in. So for example, I love constitutional law, but I hate sitting at a desk and I hate writing advices that take three weeks. So being a constitutional advice lawyer is probably not for me. Um, so that's, yeah, think about that, whether you want client-facing stuff, whether you want to do longer kind of advice work, all those sort of things make a big difference to your day-to-day -day life. Um, the other thing is just think broadly about what public interest means. It doesn't just mean being a human rights lawyer. There's, you can work in personal injury law, criminal law, policy for the government, so many things you can do. Um, but I think the biggest thing is just to really do do what you like, do what you want, and more things you like will come from that. I think maybe I'm, you know, I may be alone in this opinion, but I think that there's a lot of talk in law school about sort of strategy and how, how are you going to get to where you want to be and should you go to a commercial law firm first? And of course you should if you're interested in that and you think there's really relevant skills to get from it. But for me, it wasn't something I was interested in. Um, and I think, yeah, it's important to realise that it might seem like two years on your CV and some great skills and names, but you actually have to turn up every day. So <laughs> um, I would say, yeah, do, do what you want, do what you like, and you'll meet interesting people and do interesting things, and more interesting things will come from it. Hi guys. Quite like sitting down to high equaliser, so now I'm <laughs> exposed to myself. Um, my name's Alina, and I'm a lawyer at the Human Rights Law Centre, where I work for Lee. Um, I predominantly work in the Indigenous rights space but do a little bit of other work as well and um, have started quite recently at the centre. Um, and I, I might just say a couple of words about what the centre does because I think it's quite unique in Australia in terms of working in a really strategic way outside of the government frameworks and outside of the sort of law firms and other public interest frameworks. 
Um, and the centre really sort of combines litigation and quite sort of black letter law approaches with advocacy and community education as well. And there's a real um, focus on advocacy and campaigns based strategies to complement the more sort of black letter law work that we're doing and using those platforms to amplify that work. So everything that the centre does has a really strategic underpinning to it. Um, and that's a really amazing way, I think, to work and, and also quite unique as well. Um, I'm probably the token ex-commercial lawyer on the panel. Um, so to tell you a little bit about my history before I started at the centre, um, most recently I was working at King with Melsons. Um, I was there for three and a half years and my commercial practice was employment law but um, I was incredibly involved in a human rights law group at the firm. Um, and I think if you are thinking about a commercial path or starting in a commercial firm, I always knew that I wouldn't want to be there long term but made the decision to start there. Um, think about and do your due diligence about which firms offer good human rights opportunities. Um, without sort of, uh, there are heaps of them that get really involved and I think it's been something people have very often been surprised to hear from my experience, the extent of the human rights experience that I got at a place like Madison's because a lot of it is done very much under the radar. Um, but I got to instruct in the High Court and worked on quite a number of um, really awesome matters um, and, and made some great connections and networks through, through that experience as well. Um, so definitely, um, think about that if you are considering a commercial pathway, which firms offer those opportunities. Um, before, um, before I was at Mallison's um, during uni, like Holly, I did the professional practice unit at Springer and also the advanced prof practice subject and those were really amazing opportunities both to get a sense of what community legal sector work is like um, and also to develop some good connections and some other opportunities to do research and things like that came out of it. And definitely agree with Kat that you know opportunities spawn other opportunities, so you just got to get to one thing happening and then other things can really quickly arise out of that. Um, I also did um, clerkships. I did three commercial clerkships because I made a decision that I wanted to start at, at a firm. Um, and also an internship at the Department of Justice. And the reason I did that is to, was to get a sense of what I liked and didn't like. Again, I'd agree with Kat that it's really important to think about you know, what you're going to enjoy and also to volunteer and do those things, not just to build your CV, but also to start excluding things or including things in the type of work that you want to do. Um, I was also really into multi-faith stuff and um, did quite a bit of sort of quasi-government um, work in, in, in that space. Um, in terms of advice, I've written five things here. I'll just run through them quickly. Um, I think the main thing that I found, and I think my advice is a combination of things that I did badly and things that I by accident did kind of well. Um, but the first thing, and I think, um, is, it's the most important thing is to just put it out there. You can't underestimate the power of cold calling and cold emailing people. Um, I, quite a lot of amazing opportunities for me have come out of that. You know, even people who you think are not really accessible or high profile, if you're interested in their work, just put it out there because it doesn't hurt. And most often people will respond and either say that they're willing to catch up or to have a chat or put you in touch with somebody who you know, might have more time on their hands, but just put it out there anytime you think, oh, I'd really be interested to hear about what that person does, put it out there. Um, when you do get opportunities to ask people for advice, I found that there's two ways of doing that. One is to say, um, tell me about how you got to where you are, which is really valuable, but I think what I found more helpful is to say to people, this is who I am, this is what I enjoy, what do you advise for me in terms of, you know, you understand the profession or you're in a space that I want to get into, um, what, what advice do you have for me? So rather than asking them about their path, ask them to advise you on yours based on your interests and your skills and, and what you want to achieve. Um, think about how you want to work. This is um, probably something I didn't really think about until I decided to leave Nelson's and was thinking about where I wanted to go. Um, but, you know, think about whether you like doing black-letter law work, whether you like 
you know, interpreting legislation, reading cases, that sort of thing. If you do, you know, obviously things like the bar and, and those more traditional avenues would probably be really suitable. If, if you think, well, I'm someone who likes to, um, you know, write really in-depth analysis or um, think about broader systemic issues or think about how you communicate a legal problem to a non-legal audience and engage with the community, you know, think about the ways of working, not just what area you're interested in. Think, how do I want to achieve something in that space? Because, you know, policy work is completely different to litigation, which is completely different to campaigning and advocacy. Um, I think I already said this, but, you know, one opportunity is always likely to, you know, bear fruit to two or three other opportunities. So, you know, just get in there, do one thing and look out for other things. And as I said before, just ask the questions and, and ask for that. Um, ask for the advice and ask for the opportunities as well. Um, and the last thing, and this is something someone said to me which really resonated, so it might resonate for you. Um, a career is a really long thing. I started to have a mild panic after three and a half years at Melson that it was too late to get out and I was trapped and you know, nothing would ever eventuate and then um, a couple of really great opportunities manifested. So, you know, don't panic and, and remember that it's like a really long trajectory and, and that was a good reminder for me that in the scheme of a career, three or five or even ten years is not everything. So. That's my advice, and um, I think it's And in the interest of hyper quality, I did wait until Alina sat down before I feel that I'm the giant. Um, uh, I feel like so much has already been said, so I don't want to repeat all of the amazing advice you've already received. I'll keep it quite short. Um, how did I get to where I am? This is the first question that we were asked. So I remember when I first applied to law school and I wrote a letter um, where I explained why I wanted to become a lawyer, why was I doing this? And if I went back and read it now, nine years on, I think that I would cringe so much about what I'd written. It would probably show that um, I obviously was had such aspirational ideas about what the law could do, and equally that I had absolutely no awareness of how to get a job. Um, when I finished law, during law school, I volunteered a lot. This would be probably my number one tip for today, is to volunteer and get experience as much as you can. Um, I get asked a lot about international opportunities and people are sometimes concerned that they don't have the money or the time to be able to go and do international, very prestigious internships overseas. Um, and I would say that that it shouldn't serve as a bar to you getting to where you want to be. I volunteered at the Fitzroy Legal Service, the Fitzroy Learning Network, uh, the Victorian Gay and Lesbian Rights Lobby, Homeless Law and Seniors Law during my law degree and I learned so many things from each of them. When I finished my law degree, I was very fortunate that I was offered a number of different opportunities. Um, I was offered an associateship at the Court of Appeal, um, what are they called, traineeships at commercial law firms, and I was offered a position at the Federation of Community Legal Centres in their Community Legal Centre Law Graduate Scheme. And I had to decide which of these opportunities suited me and which was the path that I wanted to go down. So did I want to be working at a commercial law firm because of the training that it would give me? And so many people said, the training is incredible. If you go there, work there for five years, you can take any job you want after that. Did I want to work as an associate? Did I want to learn more about the ins and outs of court procedure? Did I want to be working with judges every day? Did I want to be in court every day? Or did I want to do, spoiler, this is what I did. Um, <laughs> did I want to be a community lawyer? Um, and I decided to be a community lawyer because I didn't, really know what I wanted to do, but I felt like that was the avenue that provided me with options to figure out which area of public interest I wanted to get into. And I also felt like it was the best fit for my personality. I don't think that I do well um, wearing a suit every day, although I'm wearing this fancy jacket for you today. <laughs> um, I think that I do better and my skills lie in how I can communicate with clients. Can you hear me? Sorry. And how I can, can communicate with people experiencing disadvantage in particular. And that's why I went into the public interest law sector in the first place. 
um, quick sprint for community legal centres. If you're not sure what you want to do, what's great about them is that they have what I call the golden trifecta. So they allow you to try and achieve short-term change through casework, what I see as fighting fires. A client comes in, they're getting evicted, they have criminal charges, they've experienced family violence, they're a victim of crime. You can help them to patch up that individual legal problem. You can assist with medium-term changes. These are the policy, advocacy, lobbying issues. This is where the law is unfair. And you can advocate with politicians, with governments, to try and make the laws and the policies that we have fairer, to create a fairer legal system. Or you can work towards long-term change. This is where I see community legal education going. You can educate people about their rights to prevent them getting in a position where they have to use and access the legal system in the first place. So that's my quick sprint for community legal centres. In terms, I, you can ask other questions if you'd like about my trajectory, but I might move to, you know, what would I have done differently? What advice would I have for you now embarking on this journey yourselves? I think that what everyone has said has been really, really useful to figure out what you are good at, figure out what you want to do. Um, my advice would be not to do things just because other people tell you that they are the right thing for you to do or that you should do them because they look good on your CV, but to really follow where your passions lie because you need that reason to get up um, and do it day in, day out. In terms of my experience before the Human Rights Law Centre, I've worked at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, at the North Melbourne Legal Service, now Inner Melbourne Community Legal, at the Humor and Verena Community Legal Service, which is on the border between Albury and Wodonga. Um, and the majority of my experience has been at youth law. So I worked as a youth homelessness and drug outreach lawyer, assisting clients who um, are experiencing homelessness, most of them 17, 18, 19 years old, who generally have an overlapping, intersecting issues which have to do with substance addiction and abuse, with mental health issues, with experiences of trauma, childhood trauma and family violence. And so if you don't love that kind of work, and if you're not passionate about that kind of work, you won't last. And I think it's easy when going into this sphere to think about how shiny it looks and to not think enough about some of the challenges that you have to face. You definitely don't do it for the money, so. I don't think that's a spoiler for anyone here. Um, if you've got any questions, please ask me. I have so many tips that I'd be willing to give. Um, yeah, do, should we start with questions now? Okay. Yeah. Thank you to Lee and to all four of our um, eloquent speakers that have um, told you all about their pathway and how they got to where they are. Uh, we've got um, a fair bit of time now for questions um, for any one or all of the panellists, if you, if you have any questions. Um, you kind of all touched on this. Question. I should say, uh, if, you, if, if you can pause quickly, and uh, just briefly, there's a, a radio microphone that will come to you when you ask a question. Kirsty, um, you, meant, you all kind of mentioned this briefly, uh, but I was just wondering, for someone who does kind of know that they want to go into community legal centre and work in that sphere, is it really worth applying for clerkships? Um, or is it better to go through PLT even if you have to pay to do it? Um, what kind of looks better on the resume and what's kind of more worthwhile in the long term? I should do this one, I feel, <laughs> since I went into the community legal sector. But, um, so I don't think that you should make decisions based on what you think will look good on your CV. I think that you should make these decisions based on what you want to do. Um, most people, I'm guessing most people in the room don't have the luxury of, you know, paying for a PLT, and I definitely wasn't in that position. I, it wasn't an option for me to pay for the customs of, or for College of Law. I had to get a job, and so I did a scattergun approach. I applied for everything. I did, uh, what are they called again, those clerkships? I did clerkships. <laughs> I did clerkships, I did not unpaid internships, I volunteered at community legal centres, and for my friends who've ended up in the community legal sector and for myself, there have been so many different pathways into that area. Some have volunteered first, some have gone through TLTs, some have gone through legal aid, some have gone through commercial law firms. If you want to work in a particular area, you can get yourself there if you, you know, make the decisions to get yourself there. But if you're essentially always thinking, well, if I do this thing, then it'll look good on my CV, um, you're not necessarily building the experience that you need and the connections that you need, to be honest, to get yourself into that area. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't yeah. think I'd add to that. Oh, yeah, I'll start. Okay. Um, for people who sort of are thinking they maybe don't want to go down the commercial law path, if you have, I so I did one clerkship, um, and I actually found it really, really useful. I dreaded it the day before, and I was like, what have I done? I know I don't want to be here. I have to spend the next month rocking up every day. And it was, it was great. You make um, connections with people who are in, interested in a different area from you, which I think is really valuable. You get like two days of training in legal research, because I think everyone has forgotten how to legal research by the end of their degree. Um, and you get paid to learn. So if you've got the time, I think it's, it's something valuable to do, um, even if it's not what you think you'll actually take as a graduate position. But that's, I'm sure other people wouldn't agree with that. It's just personal preference. Yeah, I would add just one more thing um, to what's been said. I think Lee and I are really good examples of, at least at the Human Rights Law Centre, the sort of two common paths to this area of work um, and probably at the centre it's split about half and half people who've come from commercial firms always knowing that they didn't want to be commercial lawyers and people who've come from the community legal sector who've sort of followed that path right from the start and there I think are definitely like I you know look at Lee's experience and some of the things that I wish that I had had the opportunity to do and maybe still will but you know I think there are pros and cons to both and if you're unsure definitely try and have a crack at both if you can, um, but you, there's definitely no right and wrong way. Do you want to move No, because no, okay. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I was just wondering how much investigating did you need to do to kind of figure out your path based on your individual personalities, whether it was more from the opportunities you got or whether it was just instinctive straight from the beginning? That's a really good question. Um, um, I, I just now when I basically or recently when I decided that I was ready to leave Melsons and make the move into public interest law, um, did a lot of investigating. You know, I spoke to some people who said I just rolled from one thing to the other and that's how I ended up where I am. But I actually um, was pretty purposeful and considered about the next step that I wanted to take. Um, and I think that really suited me, and like, I didn't do pros and cons this, but I gave like, quite a lot of thought to the next step, but also how that would feed into a broader sort of career trajectory, which is hard to foreshadow, but I think it's good to think about, not just where do I want to be now, but where do I see myself going as well. Um, and in doing that, I talked to as many people as I could who did the sort of thing that I thought would be interesting. And that was a great process because I learned that some of it actually sounded really boring in reality or did not something that I would want to do, even though they loved it. Um, and some things surprised me in, in talking to people doing lots of different things. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, yeah I was just going to say, I think, yeah, it's hard to know what to do what you want to do until you try, definitely. And you'll try opportunities you probably don't like and you'll succeed in the ones that do suit you. Mm -hmm. So I definitely did felt like going through uni, doing different subjects, I didn't really get guidance from that. Just definitely doing practical things that helped guide me. Um, yeah, and I just realised, sorry, there was another bit of advice I wanted to give, which might be relevant, people might not be, but that is that you don't have to be a lawyer yeah. as well. Yeah. So throughout um, studying at Monash, I think, it, I knew I didn't want to be a corporate lawyer, but I still felt that I had to be a lawyer and I had to consider clerkships and um, grad positions and PLT and the cost of that and it just was expected of me. That just is my personal experience. I felt that was what was expected and I'm, yeah, not working in, as a lawyer and I'm really happy. Um, but yeah, so that one. Um, in terms of sort of thinking about how your personality fits into um, what kind of working style you'll have and what sort of workplaces you'll like, I think you kind of learn more with the experience you get, like I'm sure we're all still learning, everyone is. Yeah. Um, but I'd say just, just think about it and talk to people who know you well about it. Um, you know, for me it's things like, I'm not that good at hierarchy, like, <laughs> and formality. Like, I don't think I've spoken in a commercial firm. Um, I also, I'm motivated by causes, for example, rather than by detail. And so if I'm 
not working on something I care about. I'll get bored and I probably won't do a very good job of it. So it's kind of just having that self-awareness about what you're good at, what you like, and then figuring out how that fits in to work, I guess. Yeah. Hi. Hello? Yeah. Um, so thank you all for your advice. I'm a part-time JD student here at Monash. I, I work full-time in a non-legal field and I'm finding that I have almost no time to volunteer. Now, I'm just wondering, in your opinion, how is that going to reflect on, my, on, on a CV in the future? I feel like I've spoken a lot, but I don't think it reflects badly at all. And I think that's one thing I was actually going to say in the advice is don't feel like you have to do everything. Um, if you're a JD student and you're working in a different field, that's incredible experience that you can bring to a legal job. Um, if you do want to get volunteering, I'd suggest just sort of, I guess, be a bit creative about the ways that you could do it. So you might not have time to volunteer at a CLC for a day a week, but maybe call up and see if there's someone who just needs some remote work done for like an hour or two a week or that sort of thing, but if you want to. The other thing, um, and I don't know if it's an option for you, but um, Holly and I both did the Springvale um, Professional Practice Unit and also the Advanced Professional Practice Unit, and I stayed on and volunteered at Springvale for a while after that. But it was great because it basically reflects, it, it's not quite volunteering experience because it counts for subject credit, but it's a it's diversifying the experience that you have. Um, so if that's, you should investigate whether that's an option um, and, and any other practical subjects that I know Monash, I went to Monash, I went to Monash, um, are really good at offering some practical subjects that look really good on your CV as well. I, I might add, um, I, I feel like I was very much in the same position. I also did a JD and I was, I was actually paralegally at a law, commercial law firm while I was completing it, but I didn't have a lot of time to volunteer during the day. So I would try and cram in volunteering at night where possible. Um, I would try and, I think that it is, it does look really good to have it on your CV and I've since done recruitment for community legal centres and we look at the volunteer experience that people have and it is very highly regarded. So like, even though I say don't, don't do it just so it's on the CV, it is something that is really useful. But there are things that you can do outside of the 9 to 5 volunteering, like organising events, publishing papers, being involved in things that you know, don't require perhaps you know, a frequent commitment every week, but require you to do online work maybe in a few days at a time when you've got the holidays and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, the um, Monash volunteering site is actually really valuable. I found a normal volunteering opportunity. Through that it's linked up to seek and you can take different interests you have and i think yeah any volunteering is viable and transferable skills especially where you're given quite a bit of responsibility um yeah i've got a question um i'd love to volunteer at community legal center and i've been emailing out mm -hmm. um and obviously there's high demand yeah but i'm just wondering so what sort of things would i look out for because i'd like to do it but you know it's a little bit so i've got a wait for this so yeah, yeah. Always on the wait list. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and it is difficult because often it's easier for CLCs to do recruitment at once in a year and then to go through hundreds of applications at a time for a very small number of positions. Um, I got my first volunteering gig just waiting on the wait list for a year and a half. But um, once you got that first gig, it was actually a lot easier to get the other volunteering positions. But if you're worried about getting a volunteer position, my, I, I think that my gold advice is go to the places where no people want to volunteer. Um, so if you're going to the community legal centre next to the university, guarantee there are 400 other students who've already put in their applications there. Um, the CLCs around the unis are completely saturated, but the ones a little bit further out, if you're willing to travel, are desperate for volunteers. Um, the other thing that I would say, I think it's sort of to reiterate something I said earlier, Often if you email a general admin line, your email gets completely lost in translation. So find a person, find their number, and within reason, just call, call them. Call them and then call them again and then follow up. And 
like, not that I want to open the floodgates, but we've got a volunteer at the Human Rights Law Centre and that's how she got in. She basically just persisted and found a person who she persisted with and that reflects well and you, I'm not saying that will guarantee you something, but um, just emailing admin inboxes can be a bit of a lost cause sometimes. Mm. Don't say that. You're all going to make that now. <laughs> Um, so just speaking about recruiting before, um, I was wondering what qualities and attributes you're looking for in applicants and what sort of things you prioritise and look for most in a resume or in an application? Um, well, all the recruitment processes that I've been through, there's generally a standard criteria and this was the same when I worked with the law firm, I also assisted with the recruitment for the summer clerks, which I now remember what they're called, um, and it was this, a similar kind of thing where really you're looking for people who um, can bring strengths across a range of different areas who have you know, strong marks, um, who have some relevant work experience, who have some volunteering experience, who sh show that they're interested in the position. So the selection criteria clearly show that they've put in some effort to figuring out what your organisation does, not just kind of reading the homepage and saying, oh, I love young people, I'd love to volunteer with young people, but actually finding out, okay, well, we're assisting young people experiencing homelessness who generally have issues, you know, with... Um, family violence and criminal law matters, that kind of thing, like actually figuring out what the organisation does and demonstrating that you've got an interest there, I think is also really useful. There's probably no, like if there was a magic bullet, then everyone would be getting jobs, but, but that's all I can, that's all the advice I can give. Um, I also was actually recently on a panel for the interns at DPC, and um, we had a few really good candidates, and, but what stood out with the one we chose was, yeah, just a genuine interest in the family violence space, and they've done, yeah, definitely done their research and done some experience, similar volunteering experience. Um, and also, they had quite obviously spoke to someone in government to scope out what they do would be like, which is like sort of unfair, but also yeah. just a tip, I guess, because they knew they had an expectation of the types of things they'd be asked and how to respond that then was what we were looking for. Yeah. Hi, um, you talked a little bit about what it's like to go from sort of more commercial experience to um, CLCs and community community work. I'm wondering what it's like going the opposite way, so um, going from a CLC into uh, commercial work. I don't think I've ever heard of it happening. <laughs> 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 I'd say a um, for a few reasons. Um, Commercial firms, once they start hiring at high levels, laterally will invariably hire from other firms. It's very rare, although actually one of our um, senior colleagues did work, mm. she might have gone from a smaller firm to a bigger firm and she struck that. Um, I, and so I think it would be almost impossible or very difficult to get into, well, certainly from my experience of a big commercial firm to get in at a high level if you haven't got that experience already. Um, and also, I think it's pretty rare for people who have started a career in the community sector to suddenly decide they want to be commercial lawyers because, yeah, it mostly goes the other way. Um, not to knock being a commercial lawyer because I really love the time that I had at Madison's, but, um, yeah, I can't think of any, any examples of it. Yes, we've probably got time for one more question. Who wants the last question? Um, I was just wondering if you have any tips for dealing with the kind of competitive nature of getting a job in this area. I want everyone to be social justice lawyers and to help the cause, but at the same time, I want the I want the job. Yeah. How do you how do you deal with that? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I feel like I need some time to think about that one, but I think the best approach is to try and be as not competitive or have a mindset that doesn't see it as competitive as much as you possibly can, and obviously that's very difficult if you're literally applying for the exact same job as people you know, um, but I, I really think the way to see it is that there are opportunities that come up all the time and that's 
it's a lot easier to say once you've got some experience. And I remember in uni when people would say, there's opportunities all the time. And I was like, well, where are they? Yeah. But once you get a foot in the door, it's a lot easier. And I think you just have to see it as some dogs are meant for you, some aren't. Um, there's a reason you get picked and you just go for what you want and everyone else goes for what they want and it all works out good in the end. Yeah, and I think to sort of build, <laughs> <laughs> to build on that, um, when I decided to leave Mallettons, my initial, I initially freaked out so I thought there's like no jobs that are out there that I'm interested in that, you know, I have a chance of getting. Um, and I thought, oh, this is going to be like more competitive than getting into a commercial firm, which is pretty competitive. Um, but I think as Kat was saying, I think it's about broadening what you see as the pool of opportunities. So, you know, initially I might have looked at one or two organisations, like, you know, maybe I would have looked at Human Rights Watch and thought, I'll never get a job there. But then once you start to broaden the perspective on what is a job you might enjoy, I think that was very comforting for me because I realised, well, there's not two jobs or two organisations that I'd be interested in working for. There's actually 20 or 30 and I can move around and back to that thing I said before about a career being long. Like, you might not get your perfect job now, but if you get a job that's putting you on the right path, then that's a good step. Yeah, I was going to say a similar thing is that there's no, there's no rush as well. So, as I said, I kind of did some took some opportunities near, really near the end of my degree. And even now, if I, I think if I did want to pursue social justice law, um, I could get some support from my current place of employment for study leave and stuff like that. If I want to do my PLT, and it's not worlds apart, especially if I you know, wanted to follow the area of women's issues, family violence. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, like, I think there is a feeling that you have to nail it straight after uni. And yeah, I definitely think you don't need to, unless they're, I mean, yeah, unless they're really at odds, the two opportunities, but something similar to your interests will take you transferable skills. I'm going to add something, but I think um, law school is a bizarre environment unlike any other. You take a whole bunch of Taipei personalities who are hyper competitive and then you make them fight it out for grades, right? <laughs> um, but realistically, if you want to go into public interest law, you have to be collaborative and you have to work together. Um, and the people, if you support your friends who are also interested in public interest law through law school, they will be your firm friends for life. They will help you get volunteering opportunities and job opportunities. You will be able to you know, share so much knowledge and wisdom and information from all of the different experience that you get. And that's definitely much better than you know, having to look over your shoulder all the time for the knife sticking out there. I think we do have time to squeeze one more in for somebody that's really bursting to ask one last question. There we go. Right in front. Just wait for a second for a microphone. So we'll really need the last one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, given that you said that so many opportunities tend to come from you, the catch-ups that you've had with people, how receptive do you think people are and how do you, I guess, get in touch with people who are interested in things you... You mentioned cold calling, but are there any other ways? <laughs> because sometimes that you won't get a response or, you know, because People don't know you out of the blue, you're just another yeah. face or another email. So, yeah, any advice you could give on, I guess, generating those catch ups with people so that you can start to work out where you want to be? Um, I might tell a little anecdote. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, I think you can't underestimate how receptive people are until you try. I, um, that well, three years ago, saw Julian Burnside speak at an event and then emailed him afterwards saying, I'm really interested in your work and think you're really inspirational and he said come to my chambers for catch up and I've been doing research for him for the last three years so um, you know I did that with absolutely no expectation of a response um, and what it created was an incredible opportunity to build a really great relationship and also to do some really interesting work that's I think assisted me in my career as well um, and like he's possibly as one of the most high profile human rights lawyers in the country. And I think you really can't underestimate what just writing to someone or calling someone can achieve. Yeah, I, yeah I've probably had the opposite experience of, and I think it just goes to show, it just depends who you call yeah. and when you call them and all that sort of thing. But I've, I've probably not found it as useful. I think for me it's about finding 
a connection with someone, like something that you have in common and using that. So if you go to an event, you know, having a bit of background, not in a weird stalker way, but you know, having looked at their LinkedIn, seeing that you volunteered at the same place when you're in uni or I don't know, you both whatever it is, and going up and just starting a normal conversation like a human being rather than <laughs> saying, Hi, I really want an opportunity to say, Hey, how's it going? I'm really interested in this. Um, and then, you know, after a while being like, Do you have any advice? And people I think are pretty receptive to that. The other thing is to use connections as much as you can. Like it's sort of it's often done in a very sort of yuck way in law, but I mean you all have connections, you're all in this massive room together, you're all in law, all interested in law, working at different places. Use your friends. If your friends are working at a place, say, Hey, can you set me up with a coffee with your boss? Can I come to lunch? I'll chat to them about this. People love talking about themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> To qualify, I, I, yeah. I, I agree with Kat, don't write or call asking for an opportunity, just write or call asking to hear about the person's career or the work they do because you have a genuine interest and don't make up the interest because that will be pretty transparent. So if you do have an interest and you do want to ask the questions, approach it in that way. Yeah. I always get in trouble because um, I remember what it was like being at law school and I really appreciated the mentors who gave me time to talk to me about you know, career opportunities and what I should do and gave me advice. So whenever anyone emails me, I'm a total sucker for having a coffee with them and having a chat about, well, what are you interested in? So if you're interested in working with young people, LGBTIQ rights, community legal sector, I do have some cards in my bag. <laughs> you can come up afterwards. Yeah, I'm one of those people who loves talking about themselves. So. <laughs> a piece of very practical advice for the women in the room is Victorian women lawyers. So when I wanted a job at Fiji, so I signed up for the mentoring program and they have this little section that says um, area of law that you'd like to work in. And I wrote VGSO and then got a mentor from VGSO. And that's not a competitive program that you have to like apply for. Um, you just sign up and you pay your membership and then someone will get coffee with you and chat to you. So that's, that's a very practical tip. Well, thanks everyone. I need to uh, wrap things up tonight. I'm sure we can pick their brains, but apparently it's okay to cold, to cold call them if you yeah, like, no ask further follow up questions. It's a wonderful resource, um, uh, this guide. Uh, you can get to it through the Caston Centre website. We did have it up on the screen, but our laptop seems to have died. There are some laptops scattered around the room with the, the page open if you want to have a, a little click around uh, on your way out tonight. Um, before we, we um, let you all go, I just need to plug a couple of our uh, events that we have coming up. Uh, on Friday uh, of this week, we have uh, our annual lecture uh, with the newly appointed Human Rights Commissioner, Edward Santo. Um, he's talking on peering through, the human, through human rights tinted glasses, uh, and that's held at the State Library of Victoria. Uh, so come along to that if you can on Friday. Uh, and then next week, we have a public lecture with Kabu Okai Davies, who is going to talk about literacy uh, and human rights here at, uh, at Monash University Law Chambers. Um, so thank you to all of you for coming tonight. Thank you for our four speakers. Can you can you join me in, in thanking them again? It was Holly Tan, Jacqueline Brown, and Kate Brown. Thank you to Kirsty Wise and the, and the team uh, at the Pro uh, Progressive Law Network for um, co-hosting tonight and for putting the the, um, uh, the guide together. Thanks everyone.